Stay hungry, stay foolish. It's no coincidence that most of the top 100 most valuable global brands invest heavily in technology to drive innovation in every aspect of their business, product development, operations, marketing, and customer service. In the next decade, a suite of six strategic technologies, artificial intelligence, blockchain, the Internet of Things, augmented reality, autonomous machines, and 5G networks, will drive unprecedented innovation into products and services, creating entirely new business models along the way. Investment in information technology will be a strategic imperative for every company. Every company will become a technology company, and every company will become a data company. Business operations will be retooled using both process automation and worker augmentation. Today's book is both a call to innovate for survival in a rapidly evolving competitive environment and a moral imperative to use these six technologies to serve people, elevate work and make a lasting positive impact on the world. We welcome author of The Innovation Ultimatum, how six strategic technologies will reshape every business in the 2020s. Steve Brown, welcome to the show. Thanks, Aidan. Great to be here. Steve, good news for our audience before we dive into the book is that I have a copy here strategically placed behind me. This is, uh, spot it. <laughs> this is up for grabs. I've got so. one here too. Look at that. There are two in the world. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm going to give one away, but you, you, we want people to buy your copy. So I have a copy of Steve's brilliant book, Up for Grabs. Just sign up to the innovationshow.io newsletter and you will be in with a chance to win this copy of this book. And just to say, it's it covers six technologies, but it goes so much deeper than that. And it goes into examples of those technologies, what you can do as an individual worker, but both as an organization to do to embrace these technologies. And I need to tip the cap to you, Steve, because you did a great job in taking what is often takes a book each to describe these, but you did so in such an accessible and friendly way for the user to get it. I've read enough crappy books. <laughs> I wanted to write a decent one that people would actually pick up and read and enjoy, and it it seems to have done that. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of business leaders need to know about technology. They don't need to know how to write code or, you know, create chips or whatever it might be. They just need to know how to put it all together and use it to solve real problems for people. And that's what I aim this book for. I loved the term you mentioned right at the start of the book, you call it the innovators palette, where you say, in the coming years, we will see the broad development of six important technologies. Think of these technologies as the six new colors being added to our business innovation palette. Love that. To some extent, our ability to innovate will only be limited by our imagination. And to ensure everyone listening is on the same page, I'd love if you'd give a high level paragraph on each. So maybe we'll start with AI and maybe you'll tell us first what the innovator's palette is. Yeah, so the way I've thought about it is the same way that painters use colors and combine them creatively to create a new painting. This is like six new colors in an innovator's palette. So you, know, you can combine them in creative ways to solve problems for people, to solve business problems. And so what kind of problems would you solve? Well, maybe you want to improve your offering, new products and services and experiences. Maybe you want to create new channels, new markets, reach new customers. Uh, maybe you want to elevate your workforce to help them be more productive, more creative, more intuitive, um, streamline your operations if you were working on the bottom line. And then, you know, creating new revenue streams and business models. All of those things, you can, you can work on those business vectors by combining these technologies creatively. So what are those technologies? And what are some examples of how you might combine them? Well, first off, AI. So artificial intelligence, think of it as a new type of computing. It's not like classic digital computing where you program it and it does things for you, solves problems. You give it, you know, you give it rules in the programs and it operates on those rules. Artificial intelligence is not programmed. It is trained. You give it examples and when it sees enough examples, the way the neural networks that power artificial intelligence work is they come up with their own rules for solving problems. That's important to understand because what it means is we can use artificial intelligence to solve problems that we don't know how to solve ourselves. So you can use it for applications like machine vision. 
to give robots and machines the ability to see and recognize objects and sort things on a production line. Uh, you can use it to make predictions about the future. Artificial intelligence is really a glorified pattern matching engine. It can find patterns in data that humans can't see. So uh, it's great for um, predicting the future because it looks for patterns, historical patterns, and uses those to make predictions about what might happen next. So it can be used in a wide variety of business applications to solve problems that we could not solve with traditional computing in the past. So that's number one. Took a lot longer on that one because it's the <laughs> biggest and juiciest of them all. Well, I'm going to make it longer, Steve, if that's all right, because I, yeah. I pulled a couple of li little examples to bring it to life. So as you go through them, I'll pull, a, I'll pull out some yeah, stuff. Sure. We'll run out of time. We always do. So we'll, we'll plant another seed for the future, another part two. But on AI, you mentioned there predictive patterns. And I thought it was quite fitting to think about how predictive AI could be used in the pharmaceutical industry, because you talk about this and you give some great examples. I'd love if you'd share some. Yeah, I mean, it has many predictive capabilities. So you can predict what's going to happen with your customers and in markets and whether an advert that you've tried is going to work with a particular set of, of customers. You can use it to make predictions about what chemical structures, what chemical compounds might work as drugs to interrupt disease paths inside the human body. Uh, you can use it to make predictions about public health. You know, we're all thinking about public health a lot more these days with the pandemic uh, you know, rife amongst us. Um, so you can use artificial intelligence to look at many different factors, hundreds of different factors, and accurately predict disease outbreaks like dengue fever, which affects a third of the planet. And that allows you to marshal your resources and know where to spray for mosquitoes because mosquitoes carry dengue fever. It can accurately predict an outbreak of dengue fever three months in advance um, to with 80% accuracy within a 400 meter radius. That's the kind of predictive capability that AI can, can give us to help us make better informed decisions and therefore higher quality decisions. I love your example, Steve, of AI and radiologists, where you say, as we train the neural network, we are essentially codifying the collective knowledge and several decades of professional experience from hundreds of thousands of radiologists. Their yeah. experience and diagnostic insight are captured in that model that's generated. Because I thought about that, that training the AI, people will probably be more willing to do that than training a direct human competitor, because they'll see them as a threat. <laughs> But AI is hoovering up and becoming this hive brain using all the little nuances and little bits of information from everybody. And that's going to be a way bigger threat. Well, I mean, it's not like a radiologist is sitting down with a computer and saying, well, let me show you how to do it. Right? <laughs> um, so they've been working, they've been looking at CT scans, um, MRIs, um, X-rays, and marking them for what they see in those images. So they're tagging them, yep, this is a break, this is a cancerous tumor, this is whatever it might be. And so that's tagged on those images. And those images are all in a database somewhere. So all that the AI does is ingest all of those images with the tagging, the meta tagging that says, this shows nothing, it's clean, this shows this disease, this shows a bone break here. And over time it learns, and so it can do that task just as well as a, a human radiologist, sometimes better than a human radiologist. Now that's happening not because radiologists have sat and explained it to the AI and the AI is a brilliant machine that understands <laughs> what they're saying. The AI is really dumb. It, all it can do is look at radiology charts. It can't do anything else. It's the only job it can do. But yeah, that is going, it's, it's taking all of the collective wisdom of all of those people and benefiting from that. And that's the case with all the training that we give AIs. It's all on ultimately human data and codifying our expertise and our wisdom into an AI that can help us and do things much more effectively. Now, there is a shortage, a global shortage of radiologists right now. And so this helps to augment those capabilities so that we can get all of those charts read quickly and that the clinicians can make some quick decisions to help people recover more quickly. And it raises as well something there that I mentioned, which is Sometimes we don't see AI as a threat. Sometimes people do. They see technology as a threat, so they don't embrace that oh, yeah. technology. 
But one thing you are a proponent of, and we are with this show as well, is that human and machine working together actually gets better results, even on stuff like cancer diagnostics or any of those charts or radiologists that you mentioned. Yeah, I mean, why not use an AI as a second opinion, at least? Get two eyes on every chart because humans make mistakes. Humans make mistakes in the radiology world, you know, five to 10% of the time. They miss things. And the good thing about AIs is they can look at charts over time and they can do temporal mapping. So they can learn to see something. When something is just starting to show up on a chart where you've been taking an X-ray of somebody, let's say, every week for a while, they can then trace that back and see things early on before humans are able to see that trend. So it's a very good complement to human activity. And we need to get rid of this idea that technology is purely there to replace human beings and you know, reduce costs on the bottom line. You can do that. And we've been doing that for a number of years, but it's far more effective and it has a much better impact for companies' top line growth and for their bottom lines by making people more productive if you pair machines and humans working together and work to elevate your talent and not replace them. And a lot of that work is quite computational by nature, and it's not very enjoyable work. It's certainly not creative work. And I know yeah. some of us are good at that from a neurodiversity perspective. Some of us are good at numbers, etc. But it's not. it doesn't light up everybody's fire to go and crunch the numbers and the data every day. But I wanted to build on this, Steve, because you, you do a beautiful job of introducing the technology in a simple way, giving a few examples, and then turning the mirror on us and go, what are you going to do about it? And you say, as organizations start to build a comprehensive multi-year AI strategies, they need to start to think about where to start. And you give some examples here. So if I'm an organization, maybe an SME, where do I start? You start thinking about, uh, can, I use the, can I use these technologies in my product? Can I make my, tech, my, my products more intelligent? Can I make them self-healing? Can I make them, can I create new services that could deliver through my products? So that's a, the first place you might look. You would look at your, um, your staff, where we were just talking about. Are there ways I can help to make my team more creative, more intuitive? Can I support them with artificial intelligence to help them do their jobs better? I'll give you an example of that. Um, generative design technology is used in tools from Autodesk. So Autodesk makes computer-aided design software for you know, architects and engineers and so on. And they have artificial intelligence built in that that will take the design that the human creates, so their first pass design, and then riff on it and come up with hundreds or thousands of variants of that same design that achieves the same thing, but achieves it in a slightly different way. And then it puts all of the designs through simulation and comes back to the engineer or the architect and says, you know, if you designed it this way, then it would save seven, I'm making these numbers up, seven cents per unit, or it would increase the tensile strength in this direction of this bolt by 22%, or it would make this product 14% lighter than the design you originally had. And so when Autodesk first rolled that technology out, to engineers and architects, they expected that they would come back and say, yeah, I can design more buildings, more you know, screws, more um, widgets in a day. And that was true. They were more productive. But what shocked people was that the engineers and architects, all of them came back and said they felt more creative because they could explore this much wider creative space. And that the results that they were producing were much better. Um, so it's the combination. I mean, the, the final result was not something that a human could do on their own or that a machine could do on their own. It was the collaboration of the two that gave the best result. So when companies are, are thinking about, well, okay, where do I start with AI? First of all, what kind of business problems are you trying to solve? Which means you have to understand what kind of problems you can solve with AI, which is why I wrote the book. And then you step back and think, okay, what kind of data do I need to gather is it data that I have internally? Is it data that I need to go and buy on the market? Is it data I need to get through a partnership? Because that's the fuel for AIs. You have to give them data. So today's data is tomorrow's AI fuel. And so thinking about that, what problems do I want to solve? What AIs do I need to create? What data do I need to feed those AIs? And where do I get it from? How do I organize it? How do I prepare it? 
that's the path that companies need to take when they're first starting on that journey. Yeah, I, I thought about that, Steve, from an example being, say, healthcare data, right? That I, as a kid, you know, people, there's probably no record of this, but I, as a kid, maybe had a spinal tap to check for meningitis, whatever it might be, right? That, And then later on in life, I might, uh, I might develop acne. And to the trained professional physician, they are, they, firstly, they're probably not on the same chart. But secondly, they're probably different experts, and the different experts are in different silos. So that information is never going to be connected. Those dots are never going to be connected. And I thought about a future where all that information will be in a, in a repository, and AI will be running and looking for these pattern recognition and kind of going, look, we've actually noticed acne plus spinal tap, acne at 18 equals uh, arthritis at 33, unless this happens. And that's the beautiful future I see when AI starts to produce pattern recognition that we cannot see because firstly, the data isn't there, like you say, but secondly, the machine is crunching the numbers 24, 7, 3, 6, 5. There's no way a human being can see patterns in oceans of data that is multidimensional uh, in the way that you just described. AIs can, and I think they're going to unlock many of the secrets of the universe for us because they will be able to see patterns that we can't see. I mean, they're, they're already being used in medical diagnostics. Um, there's a company called uh, FDNA. They're based in Boston, I think. And they just use a simple um, smartphone camera and you connect that to an AI up in the cloud, you take a photograph of a young kid's face, and based on subtle differences in the shape of that kid's skull, it betrays rare disease states, genetic disease states. Humans can't see that, but an AI can. Wow. And that, that reminds me of the mirror that you talk about as well, the smart mirror that actually can check, is Aiden's complexion slightly jaundiced today? Is he dehydrated, et cetera? So the, there's this, this brings us into the world of AI and IoT working together. I, I loved your palette here because I thought about it. it's a little dab of green AI and yellow, a bit of, of yellow IoT, mix them together. Oh my God, it's brown, whatever it is. Yeah, and it's, you know, AI turbocharges sensors. Another great example, uh, MIT, the um, East Coast US-based university, uh, they've been doing a lot of work with a simple radio frequency sensor. So think of it like a Wi-Fi hotspot. It sends out a radio frequency signal and it bounces back. Now, the, the, the reflections that come back, radio frequency tends to go through walls and bounce back off humans. So what comes back is sort of mess of data, but the AI can be trained to make sense of it. And it allows the AI to see through walls, see in the dark with this thing, but also to see what's going on in a room with a person without having a camera pointed at them. And this is being aimed at assisted living facilities with older people who just need someone to keep an eye on them. And so it can see if the person is standing, walking, sitting, if they've fallen over and they need help. But it's so sensitive in those radio frequency signals, it can pick out someone's heartbeat, and their breathing rate. And it can even read your sleep state. So if you're asleep, if you're in REM sleep, light sleep, dark, um, uh, deep sleep, it can tell all those different sleep states. Now, why is this all important? Why am I telling you all this? It's because there's a correlation between, you know, if you have repetitive motions around a room and you have interruptions uh, in your sleep, that can, uh, REM sleep specifically, that can be an indication of early onset Alzheimer's. If you have, you know, um, issues with your deep sleep, that can be an indication of anxiety or depression. And you can spot all of these um, impending conditions, Parkinson's, COPD, other things, just by using the sensor on a wall. Pretty amazing the kind of capabilities we can get because AI will lift the veil on the world and see it in a way that humans can never see. I was talking to Bob Johansson. He's uh, one of the consultants and founders in the Institute of the Future. He was on the show before and he was talking about how kids, when we look at kids playing computer games, for example, we think of it as a negative thing and go too much screen time. And he said something very clever that I'd never, I hadn't considered before, which was 
but it depends on what type of screen time. It's like me watching a Discovery Channel documentary versus watching some mind-numbing stuff on Netflix, whatever it might be. They're for different goals. And he said that we should be encouraging the kids to be able to immerse themselves in these technologies. And this touches a little bit towards to what you talk about, about AR and VR and MR, is that because if they can operate in that world collaboratively with others playing games, you know, Fortnite, etc., they're developing a skill set and a capability for the future that's useful because a lot of those companies are actually using those platforms to visualize data of the future. I thought that was a really interesting overlap to lap with your work as well. Yeah, computing is going to get a lot more visual in the future. And that, that brings us to one of the next technologies, which is virtual reality and augmented reality being able to immerse yourself in a digital world in the case of virtual reality, which is great for simulations and training and such, and then blending digital objects and information in your field of vision uh, with the physical world around you. So you're not disconnected from it. You know, a lot of applications, particularly in manufacturing or things that require you to be physically present in a space, the virtual reality doesn't really help you. Augmented reality blends uh, information uh, in your field of view, digital objects, and can guide you on what to do next. So being comfortable in those worlds um, as augmented reality becomes, I think, the primary visual computing interface maybe five years from now, uh, I think is setting kids up to be successful in that world of work. Yeah, and I loved some of the examples you gave there. So learning, for example, like Maxwell Maltz, the the father of this term called cyber cybernetics was talking about that the human mind doesn't know the difference between what's real and what's imagined. So by tricking it, the senses into an immersive experience, you're more likely to learn that experience. And I thought about what you talked about, both from a learning perspective, but also, I love the example of NFL. So a player is injured, he's no longer training the cognitive sense of the cognitive athlete, athlete. And he's missing out on that aspect. Plus, his muscles aren't getting trained, but actually you can trick the mind a little bit by going through immersive realities of, for example, training sessions or plays that a competitor might make. Well, yeah, and you can train the body's response to stimuli as well. So and this is a very sad example, but it's actually proven to save lives. So, you know, America has a problem with gun violence. It's in the news almost every freaking week which is crazy. But you know, now uh, Walmart, the biggest retailer in the United States, trains all of its employees with what they call active shooter situations. And the, the time, I think it was a couple of years ago in Santa Fe, where a, a, a gunman came in and started shooting in a Walmart, you know, all of the employees knew exactly what to do because they'd been through that scenario and they were able to keep their cool because they'd done it over and over and over again inside virtual reality. And that was credited by the CEO of Walmart, that training program, as allowing them to have a very rapid response. People didn't just freeze in place. Oh my God, what do I do? They would. They knew where the exits were. They knew how to get people out as quickly as possible. And they saved probably 30 to 50 lives. Beautiful, great example. And I just before we moved on, I, I wanted to just come back to IoT for a sec because there's two brilliant examples you give, and you give so many great examples to bring the technologies to life. I love the example of the billfold wallet is one, and the other is the amazing example of Starbucks in China and the music selection tool and what its goal was. I thought they were beautiful examples. They're, they're really fun. I, I use the Starbucks one a lot. The, the Billfold wallet is, is not a real product. It was a, a thought experiment uh, by a friend of mine, David Rose, um, and his team. He's, he wrote a great book called Enchanted Objects. What happens when you make an object connected and you could signal things in different ways? And so this is a wallet that's connected to your bank account in real time. If you think about your spending habits, you know, we whip out our credit cards and zip, 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 zip. And at the end of the month, oh my God, what did I do? You get the statement and think, I wish I hadn't done that. Um, this gives you feedback in real time. So in the hinge of this wallet, it's a billfold wallet that opens up. Um, there's a hinge with a variable strength hinge in it. And so as the balance in your bank account goes down, it becomes harder and harder to open your wallet and pull out the credit card. So you actually feel how poor you are and it gives you instant feedback. You don't have to pull out your phone, go in through your credentials, look at your bank account. Can I afford this pair of shoes? You know, you just feel it. It's a much simpler way, a very human way 
of communicating information. That was the point that they were trying to make. So that's the uh, that's the fun wallet there. The example from Starbucks in China. Um, in China, Starbucks is not run by Starbucks. It's a franchise operation run by another company. And they use the Wi-Fi hotspot as a sensor. Now, you might think, well, how do they do that? Whenever you walk near a Wi-Fi hotspot, even if you don't connect to it, your phone and the Wi-Fi hotspot are saying hello to each other. There's a little handshake, it's called. So the Wi-Fi hotspot sees all of these devices, all these phones in the store. Now, normally one phone equals one person. So it uses that as a proxy, as a way to count in real time how many people are in the store. And it uses that as an input to the music system. So what they do is when the store is kind of quiet, they put on chill out tunes, a bit of Sinatra, you know, and they're trying to convince you just relax, order another cup of coffee, maybe order a bit of cake this time, spend more money. If the store is busy, they increase the volume, they increase the tempo of the music, and they're getting people in and out, money, money, money. So this has had a material impact on their business results simply by counting people and controlling the music system in real time to subtly influence their buying behaviors. I absolutely love that, man. And it's, it just shows you the power of imagination that the, the technology is there. It's just how you deploy it. That's up to you. That's up to understanding your business and maybe expanding your thinking a little bit, which is what you do. And you devote next a chapter to autonomous machines, robots, cobots, drones, self-driving vehicles. And here you say AI powered machines will work alongside humans in almost every industrial sector. They will reshape the world of work and will fundamentally transform our transportation system. Perhaps we might start with some of the great examples you use in agriculture, because these are ones we don't often hear. And I love the idea of harvester robots. Yeah, I mean, there is a shortage of people willing to work in the fields, backbreaking work, you know, picking strawberries, picking raspberries, um, picking apples even. I mean, it, it's not fun work. And these robots will work you know, through the night, which is actually when you want to pick soft fruit, like strawberries and raspberries, you get less bruising when you do that. And these robots are now capable. I mean, it's a very delicate process, which is why it was all done by humans. Now the robots are able to you know, lift the leaves, spot the fruit, they can see, uh, and they're able to very gently pluck the fruit from the plant and put it into a bucket. There's another one um, that is able to pick peppers. And it is even able to look at, if you look on the underside of a pepper, if there's a little curl at the bottom of the pepper, that shape on the bottom of a pepper tells you that it's ripe and ready to pick. So this robot lifts the pepper, looks underneath it, determines if it's ready to pick, and then snips it, throws it in the bucket. So some pretty amazing robots out there. One of my favorites is um, SAM 100. Uh, comes from a company called Construction Robotics, and it lays bricks. And it work, it's called a cobot, which means a collaborative robot. It can't do it on its own, but it works in partnership with humans. They load the bricks into it. And when Sam's busy, you know, finished laying the bricks, he's pretty messy. So there's mortar squirted everywhere. They do what's called striking the wall and scooping it all off. But the team between the two of them, they're able to lay bricks six times faster than, you know, a really good human bricklayer. So, you know, the amazing examples of being much more productive by a collaboration of humans and machines working together. Yeah. And one of the things I mentioned there was drones. And you give great examples of drone seed based in Seattle, not far from you, which builds drones for precision for forestry. Now, I'd love you to share that because precision forestry, precision weed killers, for example, means that there's less waste. And when I was reading your book, um, this often happens to me, Steve, where uh, an, a thought will emerge or a, a dot will be connected with some other concept. And I thought about, we talk about blockchain, for example, as the trust protocol. But I thought about IoT plus blockchain as the the waste protocol, so avoiding waste. Yeah, so let's talk about both of those. Let's, let's hit drone seed quickly, and then we'll talk about blockchain traceability, because that's a huge thing that I think will have a profound impact on business and a profound positive impact on humanity in the world. So let's do drone seed first. Uh, they're trying to address deforestation, which is happening you know, very rapidly around the world, to be able to replant forests as quickly as possible. So a human planter can you know, have a bunch of um, saplings on their back and trudge out into a forest. 
And if they are any good, they can plant a couple of acres in a day. Um, a human planter working with a swarm of drones. So these are drones that work in collaboration. You're not controlling them individually. You're controlling the swarm and moving them around. Um, these are special drones that are fitted with, essentially it's like a paint gun in the sky, and it fires a seed with some nutrients into the soil to plant a, a tree. And you know, they can reach eight, they can cover eight times as much ground in the same time. This collaboration, this partnership of a human planter and these drones working as a swarm collaborating together. So you know, a great solution to reforestation uh, at scale. And, and this company's stated goal is to address climate change by using that as a tool. Another way that we can address climate change, you know, uh, if, if you look at deforestation, climate change, pollution, um, child labor, uh, forced labor, you know, what connects all of those things together? Ultimately, it all comes back to us as consumers, right? It is the choices that we make, the products that we buy that have that impact on the world. And yet it's not really our fault because we don't know which products to buy to minimize our impact on the planet and on other people. So having transparency in the supply chain so that when you pick up a product, you can point your phone at it and find out, okay, I've got two t-shirts here. One is 12 pounds and one is 10 pounds or 10, 10 euros, 12 euros. Which one am I going to buy? Well. This 12 euro t-shirt, yep, that, that has provenance that tells me it was made from cotton that was grown in fields that were responsibly harvested. There's proof that there weren't children uh, working in the factories sewing these together, and it wasn't forced labor in China that is picking this cotton. Okay, 12, 12 euros. This 10 euro one was cheaper, but there's no provenance for this one. It doesn't tell me whether this uh, is safe to buy. So if I don't care or I can't afford it, I'm going to buy the 10 euro t shirts. They look the same. If I can afford it and I care, I'm going to buy the 12 euro t shirt with the safety and knowledge that tracked all the way back. I know where this t shirt came from and how it was made. Now, how do you do that? That's where the blockchain technology comes in distributed ledgers, which are able to store information immutably and in a distributed fashion. What that means is when information goes into it, you can't edit it. So when you store information in there, it could be from sensors out in fields um, that monitor how much um, chemical is used on a field. It could be a way of tracing a pair of leather shoes all the way back to the cow that it came from and where that cow was raised. And to know that it wasn't raised in a field that was Amazon deforestation, you know, being able to track all of that information is where blockchains, I think, are going to really have an impact on the future of the world and the way that we buy products in the future. What I found really interesting that you go into that not many books do is that there's different generations of blockchain. And in a way, we're limited by the power we can get to them. So first generation blockchains were designed purely for cryptocurrencies and payment, while second and third generation blockchain technology added smart contracts and, and distributed apps. And that's an interesting growth curve because many people aren't under un, don't understand that in some ways the power is the limitation i mean like any technology it matures over time if you think about the very early web browser days when we could you know go on yahoo and and try and find something that was interesting to us compared to now where you know you've got video and animation and all sorts of interactive capabilities you know the web improved over time same has happened with blockchain so early blockchains sucked a lot of power and got a bad name for themselves. The latest blockchains are not even chains. They're a completely different architecture, and they're designed to be much more scalable and to use a lot less energy uh, in the way that they operate and, and to, to be used as a tool to solve a different set of business problems. Uh, creating digital twins of assets. You've seen probably a lot of stuff in the press about NFTs, non-fungible tokens, some of that is faddish. Some of it actually can be really useful. Um, and to be able to use them in the supply chain, to be able to track and trace all of this product, uh, all the products that we have, uh, I think is going to be a huge impact for us. So the only way you can do that at scale and track every product in the world 
is if you can get the power that's required right down to do that. Uh, early blockchains use a ridiculous amount of power to be able to do a transaction. Modern blockchains, uh, distributed ledger technologies, uh, use a lot less and I think are going to scale much, much better. It also links into something that we talk about where you can use blockchain to almost measure my participation in mining, for example, but also if I wanted to contribute my the, my space on the computer to a cloud storage uh, application, that's that software as a service, essentially powered by blockchain, I can do that because this is, again, something you do a great job of demystifying to make it understandable for our audience. I'd love if you'd share this. You, in, there are many applications of blockchains. I mean, we've all heard about Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrencies, which are interesting, and I think they will change the way that finance happens. But there are many other applications, for example, distributed services, the ability to, um, to distribute data, whether it's for storage or to distribute compute tasks. So let's say you have a big supercomputing task that you want to do as a researcher, but you can't afford a supercomputer. Well, there are now virtual supercomputers that use a little bit of the computing time of thousands of people's computers. And it uses blockchain as a way to securely distribute those little bits of data that needs to be worked on, the program that needs to be, to be run, to run those on all of these many thousands of host computers, and then to pay people for their time for giving up a little bit of a corner of their computer for a few hours. And, and then assembles all the information back so that the, the researcher gets to you know, have access to a supercomputer at a fraction of the normal price. The same thing works for distributing data. So rather than having a huge cloud storage company like Microsoft or Amazon or Google, you can use some of these distributed services where, again, you're just renting a little bit of space on, on thousands of people's hard drives. And blockchain is used as a way to securely distribute and store that information so that your data is just as secure as if it was on an Amazon server somewhere. And, and blockchain you talk about is way more than just distributed service tech services. One of the industries you mentioned is energy. And, and I wanted to focus on this because many of our listeners work in energy companies. And you share how blockchain based platforms exist to trade energy between a variety of different entities, but also that by understanding the data now connect collecting the connecting the the palette colors here and mixing them up a little bit. If you think about the data that feeds now the AI plus blockchain means that I can read when I have lulls in my service. So therefore, it can offer a more competitive price, I might then know somebody works in a hospital or works the night shift. So I can offer them cheaper prices based on their usage. As a result of that, those things become really interesting. In the energy sector, you're looking at the combination of pretty much all of the technologies I write about in my book. You have gigantic robots the size of skyscrapers that are used to store energy at the grid level by lifting concrete blocks and storing them as kinetic energy and then dropping them and regenerating energy back into the grid. Pretty amazing. You have um, blockchain, which is being used to trade energy as more and more energy consumers become prosumers, both producers and consumers of energy, you know, they want to know, well, when's the right time of day when I should be taking the energy from my solar panels and storing it in a battery in the garage versus when I should be selling it back to the grid? Or when should I be buying energy from the grid and storing it into my, um, my battery so I can use it later tonight? So there's AI that's going to predict what's the best time to do the various things, to, to act on the pricing as it changes in real time, um, and then sensors being used to determine what's happening in the network. So you combine all of that together, artificial intelligence, blockchain, sensors, autonomous machines, uh, suddenly you have a completely different intelligent grid, which is able to connect prosumers uh, and e even enable them to trade with each other. So there's an experiment went on in Brooklyn, in New York, a company called LO3 Energy was using blockchain so that the prosumers could trade with each other. So let's say I've got solar panels up and I'm creating more energy than I need right now. And Aiden, you live down the street and you put the kettle on for a cuppa and you need some energy, you just buy it from me rather than have to buy it from the energy company. So a completely different way of thinking about the energy grid, 
and how we might help each other as we move into this prosumer world. I was thinking about that. Do you remember there was an old Nescafe ad where the guy is always calling to the girl for looking for coffee or vice versa? Do you remember that ad where it's like kind of going, got any coffee? I was thinking of that where it's like no longer calling to your neighbor for a cup of sugar or a cup of coffee. It's like got a few kilojoules up for grabs there. <laughs> I'm I'm all out, <laughs> but uh, I I need to flush the toilet. I I, I need some energy here, man. But um, talking of kinetic energy, <laughs> but um, we had a wonderful guest that you'd love him, man. Um, Maro Ian, and his book is called Twenty Thirty. So it it really deep dives into the data behind trends that we're seeing over the next ten years. And we spoke of the future of sub-Saharan Africa, something that's often overlooked because it's not near populated nor commercialized or educated to the aspect to the level that it could be. So I'd love to build on that by mentioning a great product and service. You talk about Walla, the zero fee money and payment app aimed specifically at the African market, because this will spark a lot of our listeners work in fintech organizations or payment platforms, and they'll love to hear your insights on this. Well, it's Africa and um, Eastern and Southeastern Asia, um, where there are you know, billions of people who are unbanked. So giving them the ability to, to, to save money. Um, you know, if you earn money and you have no safe place to store it, uh, because it might get stolen, what do you do? You spend it all. You can never save your way out of your situation. So Walla gives people the ability to save in, save money uh, on their phones. And again, using blockchain technology, distributed uh, ledger technology to store um, currency uh, in an exchange and then to create savings over time and even to use it as a payment system. So rather than have to carry cash around with you and need to buy something more expensive, maybe you're buying yourself a moped to you know, kickstart your business, delivering things, delivering stuff you're making, uh, to local community. Now you can go and make that payment without having to carry lots of money with you. Everything is stored immutably on your phone. Steve, one of the things I thought we'd mention was um, we, we mentioned how, how you're going to get started. For example, AI, you said start collecting your data now, day one data, go. What about blockchain? Because a lot of people will listen to this and kind of go, I don't have a clue what to, to do there. And then they'll just do nothing. And, and I actually, it's one of the things I love about doing this show, man, and what your work and people who demystify this work to go, look, here's an insight into the future and do it in an accessible way because it informs people. But often they don't go to that extra step and go, here's what you can do to get started. And you do that. I'd love if you'd share blockchain. Well, I think with any of these technologies, and, and not just blockchain, um, you know, you're not expected to go and create all this stuff. You know, there are you have suppliers that do that for you. Um, so, you know, go talk to your suppliers and say, "Hey, I read this book, and I read that there's these business capabilities that I want that are enabled by distributed ledger technology or AI or sensors or whatever it might be. I need them to solve these problems in my business." make them happen for me. And if those suppliers say, oh, we don't know what you're talking about, or we don't have that yet, find new suppliers. Now, you don't, as business people, you don't have to understand how this technology works or create it. What you do need to know is how you can solve problems with it. So you can identify which business problems are relevant to your company, and then go find the suppliers that you need to support you in that endeavor. It's really, I and mean, that's a much higher level answer I think you were, you were poking for, but that's that's how I would do it for all of these technologies. Keep it simple. Yeah, and blockchain underpins then smart contracts. So we mentioned that blockchain 2.0, and yeah. it also changes the game, I thought, for, you mentioned Imogen Heap, who I love her. I love, love her voice, let alone her mind for the work she's done on payments through music. But also, you talk about the threats to companies like Uber, or any kind of mobility companies as well, that they need to embrace such technologies as smart contracts and blockchain. Fundamentally, what these things do is they can democratize technologies, democratize industries. So the ability to create tokens, which are you can then link to a physical object, it's called asset tokenization. That's what's fundamentally behind this idea of NFTs, non-fungible tokens, where people are selling the digital rights to a video clip or a painting or whatever it might be, um, as you know, as an NFT, you can create those tokens for anything. 
and you can use it to to sort of lubricate a market and democratize that market. Think about, I'm not going to use, you've already talked about Uber, but let's talk about real estate. You know, how many of your listeners own uh, an office building in the center of London? Not many, I'm guessing. Um, But with tokenization, what you could do is take an asset, like a hundred million euro building, and split that into many, many tokens, which you can then put out in the open market so that individual investors like you and me can then go and buy a portion of that building. So it opens up access to new markets that were previously only accessible by institutions. So watch out because you're going to see this democratization. Um, Uber used platformization to go after the taxi business. I think you'll see tokenization used to go after many big established businesses by using this democratization approach. And one of the core elements of smart contracts, for example, is disintermediation. So the disappearance of the middleman, essentially, and this is an important concept to understand. Yeah, you know, I, I live in the United States. And when I first bought some property over here, I was shocked at how many people are there with their hands out wanting to get paid when you're trying to buy a house. You know, people who have money in escrow um, for the deposit people who handle all of the title. You know, there's all this complex gubbins that goes on. You know, it's based on laws and regulations, mostly written by these people to make life complicated, Um, also to keep people safe in a transaction. But all of those things, that, that trust industry of escrow and title and insurance and all of those things, they're all in place to protect us as consumers because we're often buying from a stranger. So when you're buying from a stranger, you need that protection because you don't trust them. You know, if I hand over, I'll make it up, 30, 300,000 euros for this nice new flat in the center of Dublin, um, are they going to hand me the keys or they're just going to take my money and run? Right? You want to have that safe transaction. Smart contracts are a way of, of automating that process. So a contract is written on paper and executed uh, based on the law. A smart contract is written on a blockchain and executed in code. So it's almost like what, you know, if then. So if money goes from this account to this account, then title goes from here to here. Done. So suddenly all of that trust industry that was built to mitigate about the fact that strangers doing business together goes away. And that's the disintermediation that you're talking about. It's amazing, isn't it, that that's almost what led to all this back when Satoshi wrote the code for blockchain was, or for Bitcoin was essentially, you screwed us over, we've lost trust in you. So we're going to do our own thing here. And that's what ignited it. I always found that fascinating, that it took somebody just being or some people, whatever, whoever created it to decide enough's enough, we're going to do something here and look where we are today. I mean, they did it because they were they didn't want central authorities anymore. And so when you hear about blockchains, they're really a family of things called distributed ledger technologies. The key is the distributed. There's no centralized authority that makes decisions. Decisions are distributed around all of the people and all the computers that are involved in the network that are making these decisions and these capabilities possible. We're going to run out of time, but one of the ones that underpins or is going to, you talked about data being the fuel for AI but really the power is going to come from 5G, 6G, 7G, whatever iterations we're going to see in the future. But you talk about 5G, it's a really important one. It hasn't rolled out everywhere yet, certainly not to its potential. So let's change, let's talk about how that's going to change the world. Yeah, I mean, we talked about augmented reality, virtual reality, IoT, robots, um, AI, blockchain. The last of the six is the one that ties it all together which is 5G and satellite networks. So 5G is the first of the um, cellular networks that's designed specifically to connect things, not just cell phones, not just smartphones. So it is also designed to connect industrial equipment, parking meters, um, our homes. So it'll give competition to uh, traditional broadband and cable uh, internet networks, which should bring prices down. So it's about 10 to 100 times faster 
than 4G. You know, it's one more G. It must be better. It is 10 to 100 times faster. But more importantly, it is also more reliable. So you won't have as many dropped calls. Uh, that's important if you're a 5G connected um, autonomous vehicle. You know, you don't want to drop a connection. Um, plus, it's uh, it, it's just much more able to scale. So we'll be able to connect everything to the 5G network without overloading it, and it'll scale much better. If you've ever been to a big city and thought, I'm in a big city and I've got a horrible connection on my phone, that's because there's so many people connected. 5G is far more scalable. But 5G doesn't reach everywhere. It's going to be mostly rolled out in big cities. So how do you connect the rest of the planet? And that's where satellite networks come in, low Earth orbit satellites. So these are not like the satellites of the past that were in geostationary orbit. These are very close to the Earth, which means sending a signal up to them and back down again is very quick. So this will complement 5G, give you great connectivity anywhere on the Earth. So by the end of this decade, we'll be able to connect everything and everyone everywhere, which could mean 4 billion people potentially being connected to the internet this decade. What are we going to do? What services will they need? What capabilities will they bring? What insights will they bring that you could use in your business? Beautiful, Steve. And I was going to leave it there. You, you articulated that beautifully. But one thing I think is really important to say is, as Elon Musk said before, that he's, no, he's not really one for regulation because it slows down innovation. But in AI and a lot of these new technologies, it's one of the places we need to be slow down and make sure that we're making the right moves. It's happening regardless, but you do infuse ethics and the, the importance and the imperative of making the right decisions into the book. Yeah, I write about it a lot in the book because, as I mentioned earlier, AI is trained on examples, and typically they are human examples. And AIs aren't bad. They're not good or they're not bad. They just, they just are. But they learn from human examples. And so we have to make sure that the examples we give them are examples that we would want them to learn from. We treat them like our children, right? We want our children to learn up, to learn from us and to learn the good things from us. And not, you know, when we swear and they hear us and then they repeat it, you know, you don't want that thing to happen with an AI. So we need to <laughs> blame the AI. <laughs> yeah, you know, you got to clean the data yeah. and make sure if when before you train it to make sure that the AI is learning from the best of us. We need to have aspirations for our AIs the same way we do for our children, which is with the hope that they become better than us. Beautiful, Steve. And where can people find out more about you? You do lots of keynotes. You've, you live this stuff. You consume a huge amount of data in order to demystify it. You did a great job with this book. Where can people find out more? Yeah, so you can you can obviously get my book. It's called The Innovation Ultimatum. Uh, it's available you know, in all online bookstores. Uh, you can find me at my website, Bald Futurist, B-A-L-D, boldfuturist.com. You can find me on YouTube at YouTube slash The Bald Futurist. And you can find me on LinkedIn and Twitter, just Bald Futurist. You've, you've pretty much figured it out by now. <laughs> Brilliant, Steve. And uh, just a reminder, I have a copy up for grabs here, the Innovation Ultimatum up for grabs. Just sign up to the innovationshow.io newsletter. Author of the Innovation Ultimatum, how six strategic technologies will reshape every business in the 2020s. Steve Brown, the bald futurist, thank you for joining us. Aiden, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Nice one, man. All good? Good. That was fun.